Hello, friends. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, we send you greetings from, uh, from Palestine, um, from Jerusalem specifically. Today has been another difficult day in Palestine. Um, we had, uh, I mean, Israel has invaded Nablus city. And uh, we ha um, there has been at least five people who were killed, um, uh, five Palestinians who have been killed in Nablus and one in Nabi Saleh. Um, uh, the small village of Nabi Saleh, close to Ramallah. Um, Israeli violence continues, the occupation continues. We are in the midst of maybe an intifada or an uprising, or we really don't know what is happening, but we know that Israeli pressure um, is, continues to be on the rise and our people continue to fall victims for both Israeli violations, human rights violations, but not only that, but also um, uh, to international silence. Um, the international community continues to not act on international law or implementing international law. Um, but I want to welcome you, friends. Um, we see more people are also joining um, uh, this meeting. Today, we're very... We actually, we have um, a special guest today with us, uh, Dr. Lamis Abu Nahle. Um, we are uh, relatives and uh, we're family, um, uh, Dr. Lamis and uh, myself. Um, that's the reality of Palestine. We're all like one small family. Um, wherever you meet a Palestinian family, uh, um, two Palestinians meet, they start to figure where is their connecting point. And we don't have to go all the way back to Adam and the Eve. <laughs> it's usually, it's much closer relationships. Um, I want to thank also our good friend Ryan for also being with us today um, in this meeting and for every week with helping us with the preparations. Um, Ryan is, is the one who's actually, who helps to send the weekly newsletter. It's, a, it's an excellent um, tool of information that combines, that gives um, that shares the basics of the this week's topic or every week's topic, but also adds lots of links to um, important reports and videos. So please um, um, look, uh, read carefully the newsletter and just examine how rich and beautiful it is. I see many people from different parts um, um, of the world joining Germany and others. So, Dr. Labis, um, you are on mute. Um, could you please unmute yourself? And our tradition at uh, Kumi, can you unmute yourself by clicking on the... Um, Dr. Labis, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear us? Okay. Can yes. I what? Unmute yourself. So, yeah, I unmuted myself. <laughs> Perfect. So we have a tradition at, um, uh, we'd like each person, uh, we, each speaker introduces him or herself, and we would like you to keep this going by introducing yourself. Anna? Yes. Okay, I am Lamis Abu Nahle, a Palestinian refugee, born and lived in Ramallah so far, and I worked at Birzeit University, in uh, research and uh, teaching. I, uh, my major was linguistics, but I worked more in teaching languages as well as gender studies and development. Now I am retired, it's been two years and I am spending my time uh, volunteering, attending uh, activities at a uh, the expertise forum, for, which is for senior people, retired people. I guess that's more than enough. Um, thank you very much. Um, we're having some problems streaming on Facebook. I don't know where the problem is. Um, so we'll try to fix it. But um, as we move to the session, um, I just want to remind people that it is, although we're not streaming live on Facebook now, we might be in any minute. So please, if you don't want to appear um, on Facebook or on social media, please close your camera feed. Um, this session was, is going to be recorded and 
um, we will send you the link of uh, this session. If you'd like to share it, we invite you to do so. Um, now let us get into, um, let us not lose more time and we would like to go and um, begin with the topic after welcoming you all again. So um, uh, we hope today is to discuss the effects of the Israeli occupation on Palestinian women and their families. Um, but I mean, it is, we have a very general topic um, uh, and we're going to speak about gender justice, women issues, and get the chance to also to meet um, an inspiring Palestinian, um, Dr. Lamis Abu Nahli. Thank you very much. So uh, the stage is yours. Uh... Shall I start? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Well, I'm very honored to be with you today. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is a special occasion for me, uh, especially that I am going to talk to people who are interested in knowing more about the Palestinian, uh, I, I don't like to call it problem because it is not our problem, it's the, uh, the Israeli occupation problem. So I would like first to clarify that uh, I was told by Mr. Omar Harami that I have, I'm going to talk about the role of women in conflict with a focus on Palestinian women. And the letter of invitation specified the topic to be women and the occupation. And now I, I hear that we can talk about the Israeli occupation, its effect on family, et cetera, et cetera. So anyways, my focus, uh, I planned uh, based on the first, uh, what is this? Uh, it it was just an announcement that we are being we, we are on Facebook um, now. We fixed the problem, so I think you have to share again the screen if you want. Um, Dr. Lamis, I think we lost Dr. Lamis. She will be with us. This, um, she will join us back. Uh, I saw a number of people asked about an update regarding um, Shadi Khoury. Um, Shadi Khoury, for the people who are not aware, is, the, is a 16-year-old grandson of one of the founders of Sabil, Tamiya Khoury. He is also the son um, of both uh, Rania Elias, who heads Yabus um, Center, and Suhail Khoury, who um, was a prominent Palestinian musician and has close connections and is one of the leading leaders of the Edward Said Conservatory. So he was arrested a week ago, almost a week ago, by um, um, Israeli Israeli police army raided into his occupation forces, raided into his um, into into his house at five almost a bit after five o'clock in the morning while he was getting ready to go to school, beat him up, destroyed the school, uh, destroyed his uh, his room and his belongings, and took him to prison. Um, he. He continues to appear in front of a judge. He hasn't been officially accused, to the best of our knowledge, why they have arrested him. Um, as many of you are already aware, arresting Palestinians or even Palestinian uh, teenagers is not like uncommon. Um, this morning, the news reported that there were three people um, who were arrested in um, um, this morning, according to the news um, in Ramallah alone, the villages around Ramallah. So it's a very common incident in, in, in the West Bank. Um, Israel does not need to, to formally accuse people for the, I mean, this, it's when they arrest people why they are being held and administrative detention could last for six months, a year, and sometimes multiple years. So um, they appeared into court and this is the next, this is the third time that they get they continue to be, um, um, their arrest continues to be prolonged. So he's, theoretically, he's going to, um, they're hoping that maybe they, he will appear in front of a judge on Thursday. Although he was due to uh, Tuesday, uh, today, 
to, uh, to appear in front of the court and before it was Monday. So they, uh, Sunday, sorry. So it continues like every two days, they keep pushing it more and more and more. Um, uh, his father, yes, his mother and his father, um, they've seen him a little bit. Um, his father um, has seen him and has has witnessed violence or viol um, um, abuse on his neck, on his body. Um, he has, Shadi also said in court that he has been beaten up by the Israeli police. We know that he was beaten up even at the house where they were arresting him. Um, we don't know more details because they are not able to meet with him and, and openly speak. So please continue to hold all Palestinian prisoners, political prisoners, and Shadi in your prayers. Um, uh, Lamis, are you with us? Okay, she's joining us uh, um, now. Okay, she's here. So thank you, Ren, um, Randy. Um, you're always giving support um, for so many. You're, you're a true activist. So yes, please, whatever you think of writing an email, calling the US, um, call, calling the Israeli consulate embassy in your country, calling your uh, elected officials, just we need to keep on showing it's like people are watching and know what is happening. It's, uh, and please continue to hold uh, Shadi and his family in your prayers. They need it very much. So, Dr. Lamis. To start again with the greetings. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. I really feel honored to be with you and to have you listen to me. Hopefully that you can give me some feedback for future meetings. Okay, now, uh, at first, I would like to clarify that I decided to, not decided, I planned my talk based on the initial information I got that it is going to be on the Palestinian women, on women role in uh, conflicts. So the invitation specified that women and the occupation. So I just decided I would do something like a political role of women, under occupation of Palestinian women under occupation. Of course, I would refer also to women globally, not uh, part in particular Palestinian, but uh, uh, as you, uh, in the course of the talk, you will see that it is not spe specifically only political role, it deals with dimensions of women's role under occupation. So as I planned it, the talk would include first, the difference between conflict, war, and occupation. I find that this is, uh, people use these interchangeably, at least uh, conflict and occupation or conflict and war. And um, in my opinion, this affects the concept, how I see it, or I understand it affects how I address the issues. That's why I, I think I'd like to clarify this point. Then I move on to presenting the status of women's political participation globally. And then after that, uh, a focus on the Palestinian women in the Palestinian context, uh, political representation and participation, and see how that differs or is similar to what goes on in the world, though we live under occupation. Maybe yes, maybe not. Okay, and the, and the third, uh, and you know, we don't only live under occupation, but we also have a Palestinian uh, authority that is also under occupation. So we are really, as women, we live under two authorities. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have to struggle against the two authorities, probably. Following that, I present role models of a few women who, whom I think uh, played a main political role, but comparing them would give us an idea on how these women living in different contexts playing a political role, but in each case, the political role is different in relation to conflict, war, and uh, occupation. And then finally, I move on to the Palestinian uh, specific context, uh, talking about the different forms of 
women's participation and struggle against authorities, occupation, etc., and the different uh, struggling against the different occupations that Palestine fell under. And as you probably know, um, all of you probably know that Palestine has not been free since the Turkish Empire ruled us. And up till now, we, have, we were free people, free women, free men, etc. So a concept, we start with the conceptual difference. Uh, Starting with the term conflict, which I see carries a broad meaning that can be applied to a wide range of situations. So when we say conflict in its simplest meaning, it means it refers to two parties that are uh, in disagreement, okay, regardless of how serious or severe this uh, disagreement. The disagreement may be that on ideas, a clash of interests, etc. So they have existed conflicts existed in all societies and at all times okay sometimes referring to a struggle over principles values customs norms traditions etc sometimes based on ideology religion race ethnicity etc or political affiliation in all these cases the word conflict does not really apply to palestine in any of these because in Palestine, we have occupation, foreign occupation, a foreign country which actually took our land uh, in 1948 and, and uh, 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 occupied it, and then took the rest of, the, of Palestine and occupied it in 1967. So this cannot be conflict. We are not fighting over land because the land originally is ours. So that's why it's foreign occupation rather than conflict between a Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict is not a conflict, actually. OK, and the last thing is war. And we know that, uh, OK, well, I wanted to, to mention that we do have conflicts. It's not that there are no conflict. We may have a conflict over religious or traditional issues, like, for instance, inheritance. Some people believe in women should not be, should not inherit at all. Others should in, have the right to inherit only by Sharia law, and others see they have to have equal rights to inheritance like men. So this can be a base for conflict, a religious conflict. Okay, in the Syrian context, there is conflict, like Qasad and Al Nusra are fighting against the Israeli army, the Syrian army, and this is probably a conflict trying one party trying to have control over the and and uh, control over the the country itself while uh, there are also other um, foreign uh, uh, powers occupying uh, and and fighting in Syria so this is again a, co a combination of war and conflict and uh, what what is called um, uh, occupation okay so here, this is what I uh, think in you know, occupation, it is a country, foreign country, occupying another, taking full control over all dimensions of our lives as people of our land, et cetera, just like what the Israeli occupation doing and which is also, as I said, going towards more towards colonization, more of colonizing the country rather than just occupying it. Okay. Um, now, dealing with the political uh, role or the political struggle of women under a foreign occupation, this uh, fighting against its policies and practice. So we fight against the Israeli occupation, against its policies, practices, atrocities, and overall, above all, over its presence. We don't want it to be there. We want to get rid of it. Esar. Anything happened? Hello? What happened? Okay. The screen تبعتي راحت. اه معلش بس لا لا شيء بدهمش تعمل الناس عمالهم مش قادرين يتابعوا لانه عم بسمع بفضلوا يسمعوك مما يقرأوا السكرين. لا مش ضروري يقرأوا اسكرها؟ اه اه افضل تسكرين. اوكي. Okay, 
Okay. So here, uh, the Palestinian women's political role in the context of occupation and in the context of what I call a paralyzed Palestinian authority in an attempt to secure, they want to secure an effective position for themselves in the decision and policy making arenas. Okay, the presentation of this part, the second part is going to start with representation of women in politics, the political sphere. And here I draw on a source from the UN women titled Women in Politics. New data shows growth, but also setbacks. It was published March, 2020. Now what uh, the source starts with a statement, despite increases in the number of women at the highest level of political power, widespread gender inequalities persist. So what does such a statement mean? It means that no matter how much we increase the number of women in political position, it does not change gender inequalities. And as we see later on, this might be uh, clarified. Now, uh, uh, there are these are all numbers, like for instance, in 2020, 20 women headed a state or a government, while in 21, 5.9 of elected heads of state were women, yani nine, nine out of 152, and 6.7 heads of government. So actually, apparently, that there is a drop in the number of women who are heading a government, while in Nordic countries, all of them are headed by women. Okay, uh, political representation. Europe shows the highest rise in political representation in government. In Belgium, for instance, 57% of representation is women, is done by women, and in Lithuania, 43%. On the global level, data on countries, there are countries with 50% or more women holding ministerial portfolios, okay? But there was uh, a slight drop from 20 to 20, 2020 to 2021, from 14 to 13. Okay, so here, these are nine countries, the headed by the one who occupies the highest rank is Nicaragua, 58.82, while Andorra, Finland, France, Guinea, Bissau, Spain, 50.0. Uh, if you look at them, you don't see any Arab country, you don't see Palestine, you don't see any Middle Eastern country, yani, African, Latin American, and so on. In other parts of the world, Nab Namibia, for instance, has uh, rose from 15% to 39% of women holding uh, ministries or occupying ministries. Okay, Mongolia from 6.7 to 18.8, which means there is a rise on uh, at this level of ministries, like in Lebanon, in Tunisia, in New Zealand, all of these, there is an increase in the number or the percentage of women holding mini, uh, portfolios, ministerial portfolios. But do these ministries have a, a status that is very yani, closer to the higher decision-making positions or not? Actually, if we look at them, we would find that there are, they are mainly, uh, they occupy women's affairs, social affairs, uh, gender equality or inequality. So they are closer to the, uh, as if they, the, the ministries, their work is an extension of the reproductive role of women ministers, which is taking care of the family, serving the society as a mother, wife, etc. Only in two places we have um, uh, women taking the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of Energy, and the Ministry of Finance. Very lately, just very few, three of them uh, hold uh, this position throughout the world. Now, there are uh, countries, okay, uh, that have no women that serve in the governments. And these are Azerbaijan, Armenia, Brunei, et cetera, 
كوريا نورت كوريا بابوا جينيا سانت فينسنت سعودي اريبيا وتايلاند and i think yemen also but it doesn't show you. ah vietnam and yemen okay but uh, you know uh, what uh, like what i will say later we have to not consider numbers as a, a major indicator it is an indicator but it's not a major indicator so here in ipu secretary general chung gong general martin chung gong said that this year's growth in the number of women in political decision making is just not good enough so what he is recommending is that they have to increase to push for greater representation especially that those who are uh, um, holding uh, represent yani who are in decision making 70% of them are in health care and service workers as it appeared during the pandemic of the corona or the covid so again here these positions are more relevant related to women's reproductive role rather than to women's uh, decision making role or to women's uh, productive role okay and again no country prospers this is the un executive director and guka said no country prospers without the engagement of women Okay, we need women's representation that reflects all women and girls in all their diversities and abilities and across all cultural, social, economic, and political sectors. Okay, we have them there. They are representing other women, etc. But what follows that? What is the impact? And as we will see after uh, just presenting uh, the, the status of political participation of Palestinian women, I will go on and analyze the, um, uh, the, the I analyze what numbers mean and what uh, is their effect. Okay, so they want to push for more women, larger numbers, full partners in the decision making which is good, but how can that be done? Okay, so it, what is more important than the rates is the nature of the political participation women are involved in. As we just said, the social affairs, uh, women's affairs, uh, um, environment, uh, et cetera, these, these uh, uh, spheres. Okay, uh, now, uh, um, uh, okay. Uh, now, if we examine the status of Palestinian women in the occupied territories, and I say occupied territories because my statistics here come from UN women and they, they are focused on uh, Jerusalem, West Bank and Gaza Strip and don't have statistics on uh, historical Palestine. So, well, but here there are statistics and they are the occupied territories where the PA theoretically rules. Okay, we find the following. UN women, facts and figures, leadership and political participation. So if we look at the PLO, we find 8% only of the total PLO National Council members are women. 10 members of the PLO Central Committee. I don't know how many they are. I think they're over 100. And one out of 18 members in the Executive Committee. Now, moving from that body downwards to the Parliament, we see the rates go a bit higher, 12.9% in, in January 2006. Ministerial posts, we have three women out 24. Women's affairs, social affairs, Minister of Culture. So they are all in Gaza Strip. We had one woman minister, and she is Minister of Social of Women's Affairs. So local council here, women have a bit uh, moved uh, moved upward. Okay, so there is an increase of from eighteen percent to twenty one point four percent, two thousand ten to two thousand twelve. 
uh, of women, which were only held in the in the elections, but they were only in in West Bank in Gaza Strip. They did not hold elections of local councils. Now, political parties again, the less than twenty percent of women in the different political parties that are whether they are leftist or non-leftist. Fatah, the PFLP, the DFLP, and Palestine Democratic Union. I am sure. I'm not 100% sure, but Hamas does not have women in the higher echelons. I may be wrong. I probably have to find out about that. Student representatives bodies, 26.8 are in the councils are women. 9% of presidents of trade unions compared to 91%. So as we see, the, the higher the echelon, the higher the post, the lower the rate, the lower the post, the middle level post, the higher the rate. If we take the public sector, we find that women form 40.5 of all the posts, but they, they uh, cover the medium level, medium low level positions. 47% cover the lower level positions in the administration. Only 22% are directors and 11% general directors. Ambassadors, 4.3. So in the legal system, we have 15% judges, but Sharia judges, which actually affects and causes change in the family status law, like divorce, child, child, hadane. Uh, custody, uh, uh, marriage, uh, the conditions in the contract, all these are uh, organized by Sharia law. So 8% compared to 15% of uh, civil judges. Okay, and 32% lawyers. So the lower the level, the higher the percentage, the higher the level, the lower the percentage. Okay, now there is only one woman governor, the governorate of Ramallah. There was only one woman mayor nine years ago. And again, it is in Ramallah. And as we probably know, Ramallah is a city where every kind of organization, ministry, people, uh, you know, authorities, do, 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 as they consider it in, in their mind that it is like the capital of uh, our state. Uh, God forbid, Yani. So it is, these two have a governor and have uh, had a mayor. Three women versus 97 men in areas B and C. So we have area A and we have area B and C. So we have more women in areas B and C. Why, I'm not sure. So election, now what all this tells us, in, in, in 2005, in preparation to the election laws in 2006, uh, to the election in 2006, they, they issued the law, a law, um, elect, elector, elections law, public legislative elections law, Article 4 guarantees the representation of women by quota. 20% of the seats in local bodies should be women, so they have to appear on the list. Now, the quota regime does not apply to camp committees, so they're on, it applies only to uh, villages and towns. Okay? So, uh, 9.3 percent of the population in Palestine that live in the in the camps do not participate in local uh, council uh, local council uh, elections. Now, what do we understand from this? Okay, we are, we see that. Uh, in addition to women filling the middle and low level posts, they occupy positions, the, 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 the services in which and the decisions in which are actually closer to their uh, roles as mothers, wives, etc. Okay, now uh, the second thing, you know, throughout the national struggle against the Israeli occupation up to the signing of the Oslo Accords, 
Palestinian women had it in their minds. We don't want to end up like the Algerian women. You know, what happened with Algeria is after the independence, women were sent back to home, although they struggled and fought on equal footing with men in all kinds of struggle, but they were sent home. So Palestinian women were aware of this. So at the beginning, when uh, the technical committees were formed, the Palestinian women did not find themselves represented in these. These, uh, the role was to establish um, uh, institutions for, yeah, I mean, the basis for a state. So they struggled and got the a technical committee for women, which is today the Women's Affairs Committee. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing is that, so if they did not fight for that, they would not have gotten it. They would have been forgotten just like any other place where the majority of male representatives do not see women and exclude them, whether intentionally or unintentionally. In addition to this, they also struggled to get the quota issued in a law. So the quota is a result of a, a Palestinian women's struggle too, because they want to occupy the positions they think they deserve. So although the quota as a result is sometimes it can be positive because it gives women a chance to appear in, in political representation bodies, in, body, in representation bodies, but at the same time, uh, uh, we don't see only men, we can see these days women. However, okay, going back to the issue of whether numbers really, uh, uh, numbers really uh, indicate um, progress and uh, movement upward or not, it is, I would like to say something about the implementation of the quota. For example, in Palestine, when this was issued, uh, every electoral list had to include women on the list. 20% of the list have to be uh, women. So they cannot do the, uh, cannot ignore that because then they will be working illegally. What happened is what kind of women they, they, that they uh, uh, post on their list or enlisted. Women either that attract voters Okay, I'm not say, talking about all electoral lists, but in general, that's what happened. They, for instance, would enlist a woman from Balata because Balata camp would vote for that list. They would list women uh, that a woman that was married to a minister or a, a fighter in the PLO with a high position. A woman uh, chosen, okay, not for, does not necessarily uh, carry uh, the mission of uh, uh, fulfill, uh, uh, fulfilling the needs of the people and women and achieving the rights or achieving social change. So they were actually nominal, uh, not real uh, involvement of women in, in the election. So actually, in my opinion, um, numbers do not count as long as the, um, the, the, the effect of these women is shown. And of course, this applies also to male representatives. Okay, though following Oslo, some people thought the Palestinians are at the footsteps of building the, the states, getting the, the independent state, etc. But actually, the Israeli occupation is not ending. It has become more forceful and more in control. So it is not in our hands to hold elections. Uh, it is in our hands, but it is at any moment the Israeli uh, occupation forces can stop us from holding the elections indirectly or directly. One thing that affected women in this sense and their struggle is that they, for instance, worked on uh, uh, the law to reform the personal status law. The personal status law was uh, drafted four or five times from women's organizations, NGOs, Ministry of uh, Law, 
uh, law or legal uh, issues, uh, um, uh, human rights organization, but it is sitting on the shelf of the Legislative Council and it was uh, not uh, approved or uh, discussed even because there is a, a, a group headed by one person who religiously see that they cannot work with this. Only Sharia people can work on the personal status law. So it's not only that occupation, occupation can stop the legislative council from being active, a division between the two uh, between Gaza and, and, and Palestine, yet at the same time, when there is some kind of uh, a chance, that chance is blocked by other factors in the society. Okay, hello, women role models, I would just mention a few of them and see how these uh, women uh, struggled. Uh, um, um, I think some of you, or maybe all of you, have heard of Sojourner the Truth, Isabella Bonfrey, who uh, lived in, um, was born in the 18th century and died in the 19th century. She was abolitionist. She was human rights, women's and human rights activist, fought for the rights of the Black people, fought during the Civil War. Uh, in uh, uh, political organization, mobilizing people to participate and fight for the rights of the Black. And she was uh, escaped with her infant daughter to freedom in 1826. And she went to court to recover, recover her son. So she became the first Black woman to win a case against a white man. So what do we call such a struggle? This is a political struggle, in my opinion, because any struggle that affects and causes a change in the lives of the people, it is political. It is also a struggle in conflict where Blacks and, uh, and uh, white, the white were uh, oppressing the Blacks and the Blacks did not have the rights. And so there is a conflict on the base of race. Okay, so uh, in, in this case, uh, the, the, she also was very well known to have delivered a speech at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention. So she was political fighter for the rights of women as well as for the rights of black. In 1851, she gave this famous speech called Ain't I a Woman? Okay. And at that time, Americans uh, thought that of slaves as male and women as white, which is yeah, ridiculous. Now, if we take the Palestinian case, we have Samih Khalil. There are a, a, a numerous number of people, of women who can be role models and who can be considered uh, yani icons. But I chose Samih Khalil to introduce her because at that time, at an early time in the struggle, she was born in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. And I think she forms a model of a woman who struggled on the political level, on the social level, on the, I don't know, family level or whatever. So on all levels and made um, uh, her, uh, something important out of herself and to the country. So she was born in Anapta and Tul Karem in 1923 and died 1999 in Ramallah. Uh, she is known as Um Khalil and we Palestinians call her Khalti Um Khalil, our, um, our aunt. Now she started as a Palestinian charity worker, okay? Uh, and she became also a prominent figure in Palestinian politics. Hala, when, because she was born in a village and because she was a, a, a female, she was dropped out of school at the age of 17 and they got her married. After 1948 war, she fled with her husband to Gaza and they lived there for a while. Then they came back to the West Bank and she continued her school and graduated, okay? She came, uh, she founded Al-Inash Al-Usra Society in her garage 
uh, car garage. Now, she saw that there are lots of children after 1967 who became orphans, whose parents died, whose parents were in jail, etc. So she wanted to uh, adopt and give uh, care to these children. So it started as a charitable society, okay, and it became the largest and most effective welfare organization. However, at the, at the time being, this uh, organization is not working only uh, giving welfare assistance, but it also gives uh, support for young women in terms of vocational education, training, et cetera. Uh, she became member of the National Front Com uh, Committee and uh, uh, Democratic Front Committee and the National Committee and the Democratic Front, yani DFLP. She saw two of her children deported and one forbidden to, to re-enter. She was placed under town arrest. She was detained six times by the Israeli forces and she ran for the president of the Palestinian Authority in 1996. This shows you how much this woman is um, in a strong character, very ambitious to become and help and, and serve. And she ran against Arafat, which probably some men would not have dare do that. So what kind of role? This is a, a, an all-rounded, role that is politically in terms of struggling against occupation, being arrested, being having her children deported, but at the same time politically in terms of trying to create change in the Palestinian society. Okay, now uh, I, I don't want to go into Cecilia Bamba and another... Uh, we need to uh, keep I space for questions. I, 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 yeah. Uh, we need to have some time for questions because we're running out of time. Uh, Are we? Yes. Oh. Uh, I, I think we, we need to invite you again, um, Dr. Lamis. But I want to ask you a number of questions. Some um, we've already received. Is it OK? Uh, but, uh, <laughs> Um, I didn't know that was going to take. But we not I know. Okay, so it is. It's how much time with the command? How much time do you need? Uh, uh, maybe I I would like to just state um, like uh, five to seven minutes. Okay. Okay, maybe. and then we'll have just space for two or three questions. Okay, please continue. يعني بتقدرش انت تمدد اجتماعهم خلص بنقدر بنقدر بس في معظم الناس بيكون عندهم التزامات I have questions let's let's use the time okay okay now what I I would like to to mention that what ha, uh, have been so far uh, stated in terms or presented shows that women Palestinian women and women in general wherever they are have direct and indirect political role under Israeli occupation or against a state that governs them. So for women, they have, for Palestinian women, the role is direct through involvement directly into political resistance. For example, in the twenties, we had conferences, we had demonstrations, we had, um, they wrote uh, protest uh, statements, they, uh, in the 30s, they carried the weapons, they uh, fought with weapons, they uh, uh, demonstrated, so they were in support of the political action that was taken against the British mandate, and then later on Israeli uh, settlers, El Hagana, and, and so on, and then later on Israeli occupation. So that was direct involvement. During the 1948 till the 1967, again, women had played the role of what we call pillar for resistance. They set the pillars for resi resilience and resistance and uh, steadfastness. How did that? They 
the, the, the first they participated in the demonstrations against the uh, Jordanian rule, asking for certain rights. And at the same time, they uh, supported the prisoners, visited them in the Jordanian jails. They uh, spread the leaflets. They uh, worked politically on that level. So they were highly involved. In 1967 and on, we had first the, uh, the uh, wave of uh, operations, military operations. For instance, we have Layla Khaled who kidnapped a, um, a plane. We had the demonstrations. We had uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, fights uh, that developed in the 70s, and it was military, more military, and a lot of arms. So there were uh, martyrs, there were prisoners, there were uh, 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 political participation on all levels of women. From that time, from the 70s and on, women developed, started developing organizations. At the beginning, they were arms or uh, uh, arms supporting the political parties. They uh, were born out of the political parties. Although some leftist political parties said, do not think of liberating women socially. And at this point, we work for the national liberation of women but the women insisted that they are going to struggle on three levels, the national struggle against occupation, and they did in all ways, the economic, which is fighting for the rights of laborers, and the social, which is fighting for the rights of women. In the first intifada, again, the role of women came very, uh, and it was so enlarged, so important. Now, in addition to the obvious political struggle on the street and outside with the army, the, their involvement in the popular committees was so important. The, they in, uh, um, reformed agriculture areas. They uh, participated in teaching children in neighborhoods. They uh, distributed food. And a very important thing, which I always uh, am proud I participated in, uh, which was uh, having a campaign that to uh, knit a sweater for every prisoner. And there were thousands of prisoners and women went all over the country collecting money, collecting uh, yarn and uh, spread uh, uh, distributing the yarn, collecting the sweaters, and this actually gave support to the families of prisoners, the prisoners themselves, and it was a very important project. Although it is not a political role, it is one of the dimensions of the role of the that is in support of resistance and steadfastness. Hala, I would like to say that there is some problem arising since we started with the Oslo Agreement. At the beginning, people thought there would be a state. So what happened to these women's organizations? They forgot the national struggle as if occupation has disappeared and there was a focus on women's rights, okay? And the rights, human rights, Musharif Eshu, abuse or violence or women's killing without doubt okay these are very important but the national struggle is also important because el, um, el occupation has not disappeared now at in during the first intifada there was what we call an environment that is national and comprehensive where everybody was involved and had uh, hopes and had uh, work worked for a certain uh, project, uh, national project to be achieved. After Oslo, this started disappearing and the parties lost their role, the organization lost their role, and women's organization themselves split, became three different uh, uh, groups. One that still follows the parties and the parties are paralyzed and asleep, one that is 
turned into organizations and institutions working for the rights, violence against violence, et cetera, may, doing research, doing training, et cetera, and some organizations that still go out and you know get involved in the political struggle. But in general, the women's organization lost their base with the uh, the popular uh, uh, popular ground maybe the people so they don't have people who are uh, members of this uh, organization or that they turned into institutions now in the second intifada command something the second intifada women participated in um, stabbing killing uh, doing uh, also um, armed uh, operations. There were a lot of martyrs, a lot of uh, women who got arrested, the women who got killed, etc. Women who lost their husbands, etc. So, in in the second intifada, again, the women, also women, Palestinian women, struggled against occupation and struggled against the because they discovered that this Oslo is not giving them a state instead of a state we are losing more nowadays it's even getting worse but um i think what is happening lately is going to bring back and i hope women in the struggle but women as a, a, an incubator an embracer of what is going on in terms of resistance towards liberation, hopefully. So uh, the women, uh, uh, yani Palestinian women, have played a major role, political role, if you want to call it in terms of decision-making and policy-making, but this is not, uh, uh, has not been effective because of the different factors, particularly the patriarchal uh, ideology that uh, operate. Women played all kinds of other roles. And in my opinion, if you do like Sojourner the Truth who fought to bring back the uh, land that was expropriated from the blacks by the whites to try and give it back to them, this is a political role because the political role of that people play is refers to any activity or any work we do that is going to bring about decisions and policies that are going to affect the life of the people uh, of the people involved whether they involved in the policy making or they are affected, yeah, and they, the, the policy is and the decisions are imposed on them. So even when the mother raises children and the father, they raise children to be attached to the uh, national issue, to the struggle, to be uh, honest, to be part of um, yeah, and building the society, of building a state, this is a political role. It is reproductive, but at the same time, it's going to lead to a, a, a state, a status where these, if they work effectively and productively, and um, for, uh, in my opinion, for social change, for equality, for justice, for all people, not only for women, okay, for all people, then they are they are doing a political role. Because this in the eventual is going to, to lead to a change. Okay, and I'm sorry I have uh, said the last few ideas very briefly and fast. Oh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lamis. Um, um, maybe it's good to do multiple sessions because we try to cover so many different issues um, in one meeting, but we have a number of questions that we'd like to ask you. Um, is yeah. it 
We're going just to open, open it up for two questions. Lahza, Omar, Omar, I am just don't know where how to get to the to 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 be on the screen. You are on the screen now. We see. Ana mishay fahali. Ah, okay. It's you have to look into the. Ashan, bas I want to see the uh, chat questions. Is a. Don't worry, I will go over the chat. Okay. So, okay, okay, we're not going to be able to go on so many different questions, but um, somebody has mentioned, yes, you are right, Elu. Um, Bethlehem, there was, uh, there is a lawyer, um, there was a, lawyer, um, a female lawyer, Vera Baboon, um, which we have hosted. So, um, uh, Bethlehem had, it's also a mayor um, in the past. Ah, when? Vera Baboon. Bethlehem. Yeah, I know Vera Baboon. Where? A mayor where? In Bethlehem. Ah, Jdida, hey? No, no, from the beginning. Ah, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Okay. Um, so I counted on so, UN women's statistics, but I shouldn't have. Um, no, no, no worries. Um, uh, so it's okay. So we have um, one question is, Having a job in politics needs higher education. What can Dr. Lamise say about the number of women in universities preparing for a job in politics and uh, ah, okay. Uh, uh, shall I answer? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Uh, jobs at universities are distributed just like posts at uh, in the public sector and other than public sector. So usually you will find among the staff, you may find more women than men in the staff, in the teaching staff. And the administrative staff of the middle and lower level, definitely they are more than men. Okay, because secretaries, administrative assistants, uh, um, whatever suppliers, etc., these are mainly women most of them majority when you when you move up to the president vice president and the dean okay for instance i know at birzeit university so far we had a vice president female vice presidents only twice okay but they are mainly male vice president deans also but uh, so in general the higher the position Okay, at the universities, the less the number of women occupy that position, less than male big tier. So it is just, it, it, it has the same representation as in the uh, ministries or uh, uh, governmental institutions, public institutions. Now, I know at Birzeit University, for instance, because I, uh, worked there uh, for 38 years and I have um, lived through the different stages uh, and phases that the university went through. I know, for instance, that the last in the last 10 years, they were asking women to become vice presidents and deans, but women refused, not because they were afraid, but because the situation the university is in is so complicated and the solutions are not really uh, possible solutions. It is so hard because you have to step on the um, uh, dignity, uh, not on, uh, don't, no, no, not sorry, sorry, not this. And you're going to deprive the workers of their uh, rights, you're going to have fights with the, uh, or conflicts with the uh, trade unions and you and they keep saying there is a um, financial crisis and the financial crisis does not end and the situation outside the, the university in the society is reflecting itself on the uh, uh, university society. So people don't want, don't see that there is hope to change what is going on in Birzeit University to a better uh, situation. You but know? On, the, on the level of students, 
Um, how many students uh, make up, for example? The, the, the students, it depends on the, on the uh, specialties, on the uh, major, okay, and on the colleges. But, but still nowadays there are more women that are going into uh, special specializations that were considered male specializations in the past. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, but in general, the, the number is I think over half of the students are females at the university and less than half are male. At, in the graduate, on the graduate level with the MA programs, you also have more women, much more women than men. This has, um, there are certain uh, factors that um, uh, play a role here. For instance, men, more men uh, travel abroad to, to get their studies out, outside to do higher education. Uh, more uh, women, if the higher education can be done, yani taking courses uh, after their work, then that is better for them because they can do the work, take the courses and go back home. And that would not interrupt their, uh, multiple, the multiple role they do. So that's why, uh, and maybe women are more ambitious. Maybe men are uh, less hopeful because uh, uh, getting higher degrees does not give them uh, more chances to for work than not getting higher degrees. I don't know. Um, yeah. is, uh, um, can somebody make women in uh, villages are treated different from women in cities and then women from in refugee camps. <coughs> now, can women are women no. treated differently? Between, I mean, depending on their place of residence between a refugee oh. camp city uh, or, okay. uh, or village. Okay. Yes. Uh, now, uh, it depends on which villages we're talking about. There are some villages that are more conservative than other villages. And there are some uh, villages that are, you know, close to the, to the city and they are more uh, involved in education, going to work, etc. So there is more mobility than other villages. So sometimes the distance of the village makes them more conservative so but these days there are actually talking about education is not a problem many most the majority of families want their daughters to be educated to get at least a bachelor degree why because they want them to have a job uh, marriage market, uh, you know, having a job uh, makes uh, them uh, better, do better at the marriage market because men also want to have a stable job so that if they get married to a woman who, who is a teacher, then she has a secured salary, then, you know, the family is partly secured. Okay, and then there are a lot of, yani, people can... It's not as conservative, but there is still, yani, uh, early marriage. When does early marriage go on the rise? During the first intifada, because of the situation, because of the closure of schools and universities, you know, a rise in the percentage of early marriage. Sorry, jawzu, yalla, yalla, getting them married, okay? Even boys were getting married. In the, the yani, the, when the situation gets worse in terms of security and safety on the roads, etc. then you see this affects people who live in villages and don't have regular transportation. So it's not only on the depend, does not depend on how people think on their mentality. It also depends on how convenient transportation is, how safe it is, how you know, all this, how close the university or the school is. But 
Nowadays, after the PNA started يعني, taking control of education, they got some uh, funding and the funding uh, they got to build schools. So lots of places of يعني, most uh, villages have secondary schools for girls and for boys. If not in the same village, then in a closer village, which is not يعني, just a few kilometers from that village. So, you know, schools, they are available. The universities, now you have the Al-Quds Open University. There is uh, American University of Jenin that is starting branches in different, um, different uh, governorates, okay? Because of uh, difficulty of mobility, then the university started opening branches in different parts of the West Bank. They are putting us in cantons, you know? Nablus is separated from Ramallah, Ramallah is separated from Hebron and from Bethlehem. And so, you know, in order for the uh, universities to have more uh, or to give the chance to students to study as well as, uh, uh, Yani they, they open branches. So now Khaduri was uh, most all the time in Tulkarim area. But nowadays I heard that uh, they have a branch in Ramallah. So this uh, change, yani, the Israeli occupation forces or authorities do their best to separate us, to stop us from moving ahead, to stop us from getting educated, to uh, kill our uh, souls, but they are not succeeding. Yani. Okay, we, always, know, um, find, and we always find roundabout ways. Yes, because that's our sumut, that's our uh, resilience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our steadfastness and resilience. Yes, um, and actually now it is it's in, uh, in Nablus. We have many, I mean, it is Nablus has been under siege for um, for over a week now, um, suffering attacks and being isolated from the rest of the West Bank and mm. Palestine. Um, mm. Ten minutes um, beyond the one hour. It has been great having you with us, uh, Dr. Lamias. Um, we appreciate your perspective, your input, and um, the wealth of information you have shared with us. So, thank you so much. Yani. Was that was my we want to honor thank you. to me and i'm sorry at the end i was not uh, well organized because you know you, I was you were it was an excellent um it was an excellent um presentation um thank, thank you thank you so much very rich with information thank so, you um thank you very much dr lamis thank you all for being with us sorry we went over the one hour we try not to go most of the times but we had some internet problems and uh, um, challenges. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and please keep um, Palestine on your mind, especially Palestine <coughs> and especially our friend Shadi. Nice meeting you all, Kum. Now, can you tell Kumi. me what that stands for, Kumi? Kumi. I will call you and uh, let you know. Um, uh, ah, okay, explain to me. <laughs> okay. Kumi now. Kumi, Kumi okay. right now. now. Rise up, Kumi. Okay. Okay, friends. Goodbye. Thank you.